Good evening, welcome along to Inside the Hive. Yes, I know it's a Friday, it's not a Thursday, but we are still live with you here at Vicarage Road for the next hour. We've got a great show on the way for you tonight. We've got another 60 second challenge. Uh, Peter Atibo is gonna be taking it on tonight. We bring back the Watford Greatest 11. We're gonna be picking a right side of midfield player this evening. We're gonna look ahead to the game on Sunday, of course, when we travel to Southampton. And as always, I've got two cracking guests in the studio, so make sure you get your questions in. You know how to do that by now. If you're watching live on YouTube, put it in the comments section below or on Twitter at Watford FC and use the hashtag of inside the hive. Now, of course, I can't do this show on my own. I have some great guests with me as always. And one of them, of course, we have every single week. Some of you who watched last week will, of course, know he's now becoming the master of DIY. It's the one, the only Mr. Tommy Mooney. Tommy, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good and, evening. And how's this weekend's do-it-yourself action been? Uh, still no golf. <laughs> which is obviously irritating um, and my DIY skills have I've finally waved the white flag and I've got the professionals coming tomorrow to cover up all of my botched work. <laughs> At least you've admitted defeat gracefully though. So Absolutely. That's all right. uh, Tommy, good to have you as always. Uh, my second guest tonight is the epitome of a one club man, an absolute legend and it's the one and the only Mr Kenny Jacket. Kenny, how are you? Very good, thanks. Thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. Um, we're going to kick things off with some exciting news today. You're our newest Hornets ambassador. Um, tell us a little bit about that for you. Yeah, well, first I'd like to say thanks for the invitation. Um, it's, it's a good list, I've got to say. It's a fantastic list of players and uh, I'm honoured to be joining it and, and looking forward to it as well. Mm, of course, Tommy, you're on that list as well. And I know it's something you're incredibly proud of, that the work that you will do as ambassadors is incredibly special. Yeah, I think if you ask all of the players that, that have been um, asked to do it, we're all more than happy to, to be back working for the for the football club and you know whatever is asked of us I don't imagine too many of the lads turn anything down. No massively well said Ken it's great to welcome you to that illustrious list. Um, plenty to get through tonight um, and let's just kick off with your with your memories of of Watford of course as I mentioned the epitome of a, a one club man you got some great stats while you were here as well some great moments and memories. Yeah the big thing for me was a you know I was a, was a, a Watford lad so I was born and bred in Watford and played for my hometown club and you know from uh, from my mum my and dad's house you could, you could see the floodlights and um, you know coming here as a supporter and then being able to play for the club was fantastic and um, after retiring through injury at 28 I joined the the coaching staff and, and did many jobs there as well which was a you know a fantastic grounding for me so yeah my hometown club and, and happy days definitely and, and, and looking at this it looks a long time ago <laughs> um, and I, th I think generally it, through these clips I mean, the, the game plan was give it to John Barnes. I think that was generally it. <laughs> That's amazing. Of course, uh, Tommy as well, you know, with, with, with Kenny's time here, you know, you, with, with the coaching side of things as well, you guys have, have worked together before? Yeah, look at Kenny's stats there. It's fabulous. Very, very rare that it, that it happens. Obviously, at Watford, we're, we're aware that, you know, I think of Gibbo as well, um, being one club, one club men. But yeah, Kenny and I were. I think you were in the youth team when when I very first came, youth yeah. team manager, yeah, and then that's it. obviously yeah. when the gaffer came back, yeah. he came in as assistant manager with Luther. So yeah, we worked together. We've enjoyed success together and enjoyed the football club together. Mm. We're going to mention uh, the gaffer, Graham Taylor, a couple of times tonight. Let's start off with your thoughts on him. Of course, managing you as a player, um, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a thread of this club, which is is just a constant, which is lovely. But what are your memories of him as your as your manager, your gaffer? Yeah, it, to be fair, first and foremost, as a per, is a genius of a, of a man. Uh, I played for him for ten years, and then was assistant manager for four. And it was an interesting con contrast because you know when you're playing, you're into your own career, and you you don't think about the bigger picture maybe of the club. But then coming onto the staff and then working with him, and and I've got to say, both times he came into the club. He just absolutely stood stood the club on its head both times, and 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 he was so clever and so quick. I mean, some of his um, assessments after a game would be fantastic. You know, where um, we'd, I was assistant manager, so we'd watch a game, watch our game, watch it again, and it, and he had a, a instant recall of of the whole of the game. You know, every detail. Yeah. And I'd be like watching the video about six times and, you know, <laughs> guys, right again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if he'd have made that run there, he could have taken him away and he could have got in, you know. And it's like, it's, he, was, he was very, very clever and very, very quick. And, and I've, you know, like I said, stood the club on its head twice. But, yeah, genius of a man, yeah. No, it certainly was. No, absolutely. I, I remember 
Ken was coaching and I had the spell at centre half and at left left wing back and you know Ken had taken me out after training and you you probably don't remember it yet but I, I definitely do because it was new to me you were trying to get me to come inside to draw them and sure. then flick the ball out and try and whip a crossing you know we'd, we'd have to have a, a full training session with the gaffer and then I'd go and do an extra 45 minutes because you love to be on a training pitch yeah and I was I was breathing out on my backside I couldn't couldn't wait to get in and get a hot shower <laughs> From old the first time, Taylors. the first time through, I mean, he had more time really to be fair, and really did build the club from right from the bottom and, and, and off the pitch as well. He was a fantastic, fantastic influence. You know, people of of Watford know that he was more than a football manager uh, to to the whole town. But the second time he came through, he just you know picked it up really, really quickly. The the run at the end of the season in in '99, where we won seven of the last eight, and then went went into the playoffs and won it at Wembley. You know the the belief in the squad there at that time. You know, and and, and he created a an energy, didn't he? Yeah. At that particular time, and you know, fantastic forward momentum for the club. Mm. Just made you feel like every match they came around, you were, you were expected to win the game. Probably, I, I hadn't played for another manager like that. Even though I'd seen the gaffer at, at Aston Villa, I wasn't part of the first team setup. I just stood my back against the wall as he walked past. It was almost like he. You know, you, you you didn't want to, to to have to deal with him, but when he came in to the football club later, and I was a first team player, it was very different. It just gives you so much confidence and responsibility, and I think you had to take that responsibility because you might not get a second chance with him. He's one of those if he if he gives you a, a role to do and you don't do it, then you know he might lose trust in you. He had a fantastic ability to get hold of a room full of players and get everybody in the you know going in the right direction, didn't he? Yeah. You know, he could he just sort of. Yeah, he could get everybody just singing off the same hymn sheet very, very quickly. He's a real, real talented man. Yeah, yeah an incredible man. Incredible. Let's talk about some of your successes on the pitch here then as a player. Um, let's kick off with winning promotions to the first division and then obviously finishing second in the top flight as well. Um, some good memories for you on the pitch in that, those times? Yeah, it was terrific. Coming through as a, let's say, as a youth team player and then getting into the first team at 18, it was during the time when we were coming through the divisions. And as you say, getting up into the top division you know, the first year, um, finishing second, and it, and it was a you know a big one for somebody who'd been a supporter, you know for myself to maybe at at 15 stood on the terraces or watching it, and then suddenly at 18 you're playing and and playing in the top division. That that year anyway, our first year up, we beat Arsenal away and beat Spurs away within a few weeks, you know, and they were the they were the big ones, they were the big scalps that we we really wanted, you know. And don't get me wrong, in in years come in years gone past, then they got back at us pretty quick. But um, it was a big year and a big time. A a and going through, going into every season, we felt we could achieve something, you know, going into whatever division. Um, some really good players there uh, uh, coming into the, 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 the top division and some brilliant signings by the, by the manager as well. You've got to say, at the time, maybe Pat Rice, you know, was a, was a fantastic signing. N none of us had any experience. We'd either come through the youth policy or we come out of the lower divisions. And, and you know, we had some fantastic players um, here then at that particular time and, and you know it was, it was a, a time where the club had fantastic momentum again and, and it was hard to stop it. Mm. You mentioned obviously yourself growing up around the club as well I mean we speak so much on this show about the fans and how incredible they are and how how much they play the part um, how, how was it for you achieving all the success and inside you're, you're still that fan who remembers being on the terrace and being able to celebrate with all those fans in the stands inside Vicarage Road? Yeah it was surreal obviously my family as well all local so it, it was surreal but you know I was very proud to be honest with you to, to, to have you know made it I was think I was training here at maybe 12 years old something like that and then and then got through and you know yeah playing in the first team and, and playing in a very good side as well you know I came into I come into a team with some excellent senior pros and some very good young players coming through and, and, and the side just kept improving you know I can remember by the time we did get through to the top division if you if you, if you had a training session if you had a first team against the reserves it was a really good competition and there were some good players around, so you know if you're going into a good team, as long as you can hold your own, you always felt that um, you could get results. Mm. Let's talk about the FA Cup, 1984. Obviously, getting to Wembley and, and losing and losing in the final sometimes always like tarnishes the memories of that journey because no one wants to go to a FA Cup final and lose. But looking back on it, that journey to get there with the, with the games that it took to get there, is there? Do you look back at it on some fondness now? Yeah, definitely. I, I think what it was as well, it, it, you know, it was showed the journey that Watford had been on and how far they came to, to, to get to the cup final, that was it. We played against a very good 
Everton team. It maybe knocked us a little bit more than it should have at the time. We should have maybe just, you know, regrouped and, and, and gone again. And it, it did knock us definitely. Uh, but Everton at that particular time would, were, you know, they, they were unlucky the, with, with the the. the the, um, the, the side they had, they were just coming out of Liverpool's shadow at that particular time and, and were, were you know, a very good team and it knocked us quite a lot. But, but you know, when you're looking at it in the bigger picture, it showed how far that, that, that we'd come and, and, and wanted to push on from there. Mm. Tommy, of course, getting to a, a final with, with any team is special, but obviously getting to one with Watford is, is incredible. Yeah, I was actually at that, the FA Cup final when, when uh, Everton won. I, I actually wore an Everton hat for the game and supported Everton. Just purely because they were northern. That's how. That's I can't how believe you've is. just said that. Absolutely. Watford legend status is shaking there. The fans are watching this. You wore an Everton hat in that final. I was only 13. You've got to give me a break. <laughs> Little did I know that many years later I'd be wearing the yellow of the, the, <laughs> the, the, the Watford shirt. But yeah, absolutely. The finals are, are what the supporters remember. And, you know, players are no different. Absolutely. Um, they're the. The, the key things that you go to, if you win them. If you don't win them, you, then you try and forget them as quickly as possible. No, massively. Um, of course, uh, we've got the ambassadors on there, on the big screen, which we mentioned a little bit earlier on the show, that kind of features you both on there. So some, some great names on there and players that you would have played with as well, Kenny, and some, some familiar yeah, names. Yeah, played with, coached and, uh, along the way. And as you say, you know, it's a privilege to be on the, on the list. Yeah, massively. Let's now turn our attention to that UEFA Cup campaign as well getting to play in Europe for your home team that's pretty special yeah it was and you know we, we attacked it and, and attacked the sides and it's a different type of football you know your first time playing in Europe I, I was playing for Wales by then so I had quite a sort of broad, broad range of experience of, of playing against different opposition and, and it was different it, it really was different but you know we took on some some big boys and um, had a really good run in that particular competition and, and again you know, the big thing was it was a first for Watford and, and you know, we were proud to get there. Mm. Obviously, we've mentioned one club man. Um, was there ever an opportunity to, to move on? Did anyone ever come knocking or was that never on the agenda for there you? Was, there was different times where, and, and probably when Graham Taylor left, he tried to take me to Villa and I didn't get, it, just, it didn't, one reason or another, it didn't come off. Uh, and then I had you know, an, another couple around about that time, but then um, decided to stay and, and you know, see if we could get back up the first year when we when we because we spent six years in the top level the first year down then to what now is a championship we got into the playoffs and and you know unlucky not to come straight back up you know in in, in that one and um after that i got me injury so uh, uh, i wouldn't say close a couple of times a, a couple of th things come up but but turned them down and uh you know wanted to get watford back up yeah, Mash, I think we're Watford fans certainly grateful of your commitment and service to the club 100%. And uh, of course, don't forget, get your questions in. We're going to chat plenty more uh, with Kenny throughout the show on his memory. So please get involved, send your questions in. Uh, we always love to hear from you on the show. You know how to do it by now. If you're watching on YouTube, comment sections below. Or if you're on Twitter, at WatfordFC and use the hashtag of Inside the Hive. Uh, still lots to come on the show tonight, but now let's reflect on the last couple of games. Um, Tommy, obviously disappointing results when we look at the score lines. Um, just your reflection on the last couple. Yeah, it's been difficult because the, you're getting to the point in the season where you've got, you've got to start winning games. Uh, and while we had, you know, the scoreline looks closer, the Arsenal performance was, was a long way from uh, the level required. And then last night at Wolves, it was just a, a, a mad 20 minutes, which made the rest of the game so difficult because you could see the confidence come back into the Wolves players and the, the atmosphere at Molyneux was just starting to die down and then they get their goals, which, you know, obviously lifted them for the rest of the game. So it's been a difficult period. Um, but I, I'm always one where I think that the sooner the next game comes, the better it is. And, you know, we've got a chance to go to Southampton on Sunday and put it right. OK, that next game, of course, on Sunday, Southampton, they've lost their last two. Um, but there are games coming up for Watford where they're playing teams around them. So from a manager's perspective and from, from your experience, what do you do in this situation? Now, how do you get the team backfiring on some cylinders after a disappointing week? The opportunity is still there for them. It's not as if um, there's a big gap. You know, the, the other sides around them are struggling as well, have got their own problems. And, and I know that, you know, you, you, sort of, you do work off your own performance, definitely, but it's, it's very much still there for Watford to, to get out. And as you say, Southampton's a game, they've lost their last two. 
um, you, you, you have to keep persevering and you have to keep going and you have to show your character and you know situations like this do show people's character you're looking looking into into April and there's some really big games isn't there and, and you've got to see them as as opportunities because just just now anyway you know apart, apart from Newcastle nobody's really pulled out of that of that area and, and, and other you know Leeds lost last night as well so the opportunities are still there 10 games to go yeah, it must be. As a manager, what kind of things do you do? You, do you sometimes look at those games and try and do something different, or do you kind of stick to what you've been doing and hope that the kind of the kind of performance improves because the message of what you're trying to achieve starts to come through? How, how how do you attack those situations? First off, you always want your best players because you know that's a, a basic. But you know, if, if if you can get if you get one or two back, if one or two are a little bit fitter and and into maybe a little bit more of a rhythm, so try to get your best side available uh, um, first uh, uh, and then you know be, be honest with the players about where they are I don't think you can sort of paper over the cracks but then similarly you have to leave it with you know with an, uh, an opt optimistic opportunity and, and let's say the, the stakes are big aren't they at the moment staying in the Premier League massively keeping it positive I think is one of the most important things we can do on that and if I say we look forward to that next game against Southampton at the weekend. Now let's look back slightly to the Arsenal game the other week because uh, this week is the level playing field week of action and dis disabled fans from both Watford and Arsenal got together at last week's game and here's a little bit of insight. Follow me. You know the first contact will probably be where um, disabled supporters will start to encounter problems. Um, and actually, if not the first contact, actually they can be the one that really can intervene and, and, and fix things. Um, but I think there's a role for the supporters themselves. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, we'll take you through, get you sat down, then I'll get that soccer site over to you, all right? If there's any worries that the fans have, the disabled supporters have, they can then iron them out with the, support, um, with the DLOs um, and they can speak to them because if you don't talk, um, it goes without saying that you'll never really get anywhere. So I think talking is a big part and just um, help, you know, having the support of them and like uh, vice versa. So I think it's very important that this carries on and we build from this the relationship between disabled supporters and the disability liaison officers. I think, it, I think it's really important that clubs, um, especially the disability um, liaison officers, access managers, whatever they are, whatever their title, that they work together and I've seen this um, especially with our new um, disability access manager. Do you want to go up? No, no, I'll say yes. So when you want something to eat, it's all right. Enjoy the game, yeah? It, it's it's a, a great variety uh, uh, of experiences, some extremely poor in terms of not being able to see the game from a wheelchair, simply because, um, particularly on some of the new stadiums even, the architects have not um, involved disabled people, as they should have done, when they're actually putting the, the plans together, and therefore a lot of the sight lines um, are, are obstructed by um, uh, uh, supporters standing in front of them and those wheelchairs should be elevated so that they can see over them. Uh, here of course we, we don't have that problem. Uh, again I'm proud of the fact that, that that is the case. We usually get extremely good responses. If you're disabled in, in, out in what I call the real world people tend to see first thing they think is what can't this person do? What can't this person contribute? Whereas in reality, if they turned it round and said, OK, this person can do a job, albeit differently, but they can do a job, therefore they're earning money, therefore we can get through the turnstiles. If you can get them into the ground and they know they can see, they're looked after, they feel safe, they feel part of it, that's the most important thing is that you feel part of it. And once, you, once you've got the bug, that's it, mate. Your circumstances might change outside, um, but you never change your football club.
But if you want to find out more about the Level Playing Field Week and see the full interview, you can do that via the website, of course, uh, and also on the social media channels. Now, if you joined us last week, you'll know we had a fantastic special celebrating International Women's Day, and there's been a poetry competition which has been run, and one young fan got a very special surprise. Hi, I'm Flo Fife, and I'm Anna Maivald, and we play for What For Women. We're going to be judging the finalists of the International Women's Day poem competition today. So we've got three poems here, and we're going to say the things that we like um, and which one we think is the best. <laughs> yeah. And then the final one, so Rebecca Elson, um, who's a junior hornet. Well, yeah. I think we might have saved the best for yeah, last, really. That, I think the thing that I like most about that one is that it really resonates with us. Because we so, want to inspire girls, don't we? Like, I yeah. think that's why we play football, like we want to... But even with our own teammates, like when we win a match, seeing the whole team and everyone's mm. reaction, like it brightens up our day and that's one of, the, one of the reasons we play really. And yeah, I think it's nice that hopefully we can inspire young people like that um, by yeah, playing. So yeah, I think that one's probably... I think we've got our clear yeah, winner, really. All, all of them were, were brilliant, but yeah, yeah I think the third sure. one definitely takes it, so yeah, well done to Rebecca. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> How are we? Good, good. Which one of you is Rebecca? <laughs> well, I think there's a congratulations in order because I hear that you wrote an amazing poem. I saw that you wrote an amazing poem. I open my eyes and all I can see is black and white. But when the girls walk on the pitch, I feel like a different person. Not just black and white, but all the colours of the rainbow. I can feel the love and joy surrounding me. And when I see their faces, when they win a match... It brightens up my day like nothing matters anymore. Now I feel I can do anything. I'm invincible. I want to write about them in my own books that soon I will see in my local bookstore in the window. These girls make me believe I can achieve anything. These girls make me proud, not just today, but every day. I want my teammates to be every colour of the rainbow. So some great celebrations there on the back of International Women's Day last week. Uh, as we've mentioned at the top of the show, then delighted to announce that Kenny Jacket is now one of our Hornets ambassadors joining an illustrious list, including the one and only Mr. Tommy Mooney in there as well. And of course, if you want to find out more about our ambassadors, very simple, go to watfordfc.com forward slash history forward slash Hornets hyphen ambassadors. Ambassadors. Uh, time now then to get your questions on the go and also our usual game of Ask Tommy. Uh, Kenny, this game is very simple. We're going to ask Tommy some very difficult questions and then we, later on in the show we're going to ask you some easy ones. So it's uh, <laughs> our weekly bit of fun with Tommy. Uh, I've mixed it up a little bit this week. Oh, that normally, make, make a change. Well, I know. Well, normally we open with a golf question yeah. um, and I thought that, that was a bit too easy this week. So I thought I'd open up with a DIY question. <laughs> because Tommy's been busy with the DIY. Uh, so question one for you, Tommy. As we know, you love a bit of DIY currently, especially painting. So your first question is, can you name the breed of sheepdog from the famous Dulux paint TV adverts? This is how the game works, Kenny, it's great. Can you see, you're embarrassed you've come on the show now, Ken, that, <laughs> that level of question. It's, um, it's a breed of sheepdog. The Dulux dog? Yeah. The, the grey and white one? Yeah. But what breed of sheepdog is it? I know the answer to that. Go on. If you told me you were asking me stupid questions this week instead of my golf one, that's, my golf one's the only one I get right, Ken. <laughs> um, it is a British sheepdog. Close. It's an English sheepdog. Oh, close. Come I can't on. give you a point for that, but, I, but it was close. It's a valiant effort. Uh, question number two. Frank Jacket, Kenny's father, also played for Watford between 1949 and 1953. But how many appearances did he make for Watford in total? Was it A14, B12, or C16? 16. 16. 14, according just, to the internet. I think you've missed out on two cup games. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's, and, unless Kenny knows a different number. I didn't think it was as much as that, to be honest with you. As much as 14, I thought it was less. But, but we'll take Hart Senior Cup games might be in there as well. <laughs> yeah, we'll there was two 14. of those, so yeah, it was actually so. 16. It's 14. Unfortunately, Tommy, you're still on no points. Uh, question number three. Our guests this evening, of course, played international football for Wales. But how many appearances did they make 
for Wales? Was it 31, 28 or 34? If you're watching closely, the graphic at the top of the show did have this number on. I was trying to look at the graphic, but you were talking to me. I didn't want to appear rude. <laughs> 31 it is. Correct. Point on the board. And your final question for the moment, uh, because, uh, oh, there we go. There's the stats. Um, there we go, 31 international appearances. If you'd seen that properly the first time as well, uh, you would have seen that answer on there as well. So we sometimes help Tommy out a little bit by giving him some clues. Uh, final question for the moment. How many Championship Manager of the Month awards has Kenny won? Well, what are the options? Uh, I'll give you some options. I'll make some up on the spot. Uh, two, three or four? Um, four. Correct answer is? Three. Three. There was uh, two at Millwall, April 2012, November 2012, and Wolverhampton Wanderers, August 2014. So you've got one point, Tommy. Uh, question five we'll do a little bit later on. Uh, I, I don't think there's going to be any chance of there being a tie break with that question, because I think Kenny's going to do it on his questions. But uh, a valiant effort, Tommy. You've not scored one in a long time. That's not bad. No, there's no, you, you've penalised me for saying British, and I'm just being inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, no golf question. There wasn't a golf question. I'll bring the golf question back next week. I'll bring that next week. Uh, time now for the most important questions on the show. They are the questions that you've sent in. So thank you so much uh, for doing that. Uh, the first question comes from Dan Allen, uh, and he would like to ask uh, you, Kenny, what was your best moment ever at Watford? There's a few, to be honest with you, that um, you know that it's hard to just say it was it was it was just one. Um, the the 90, when I was assistant manager, the 99 win at Wembley was special. Getting into the Premier League, you know, was a was a, a fantastic moment. I think 82-83 um, when we finished second, beat Liverpool on the last day to finish second here, which was a big day. And, and then another, a very mem memorable one for myself was when I played for Wales against England at Wembley, and I played centre back. And Luther played for England centre forward, so oh, nice. it was a good Watford one as well. Yeah. So you know they're they're the big ones in terms of you know quite a wide range really in terms of playing and coaching uh, through my career. Yeah, some special memories there. Uh, next question comes from Rudy Johnson. Uh, what was your favourite goal you ever scored? Um, the one at Arsenal. I scored. Yeah, I scored one at Arsenal. It. Um, hit Luther on the way through but <laughs> he let me off he let me have it to be honest he's such a nice <laughs> fellow Luther he let me have it and uh, I think the lads modern day would have, would have taken it but uh, now it was a volley at Arsenal where we won 4-2 mm. uh, Max Wayne your question is very similar to the first one we asked um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip past that one Mac thank you very much for your question sending in uh, Tom Davies says uh, what's your favourite memory as a manager so far yeah again there's there, there is different ones um, probably going to Swansea and yeah, promotion at Swansea was a was a big one because it was very early for me to be honest with you. And I, you know, I needed to I needed to be successful, and and you know needed to do it. So yeah, promotion at Swansea was the biggest one. Yeah, nice. Uh, Rory Williams has the next question. Uh, what was the secret behind the success of the eighty two eighty three season when you finished second? Well, first as, as ever, it's good players. And that's you know, it's, and it's not ever a secret. I mean, that that particular side side was an excellent team. Um, John Barnes was, he was the best player in the country, really, and, and he didn't get the sort of national recognition until he went to Liverpool, but for three or four years here he was unbelievable, he was fantastic. L Luther was, you know, nearly up there with him really, he was in the England team and top of the goal scoring charts, and there's a lad called Nigel Callaghan who, you know, anybody watched at the time realised that he was up there with those guys as well, you know, and didn't quite get as, as much publicity, so, you know, we had a very good team. Um, uh, and, and you know that's that's the, that's a big thing. And and Graham had set, you know, as as a, as a club, they they'd really had some years to build that side up. And and you know when John left, it was difficult to to, to, to reach the heights when you have such a special player. Mm. Final question for the moment comes from Michael Stills. Um, what was your favourite memory at Vicarage Road, either as a player or as a manager? I think actually atmosphere at Vicarage Road. We beat South. Yeah, we beat Southampton seven one. And um, it was in the League Cup. We'd lost 4 0 away and obviously thought it was over. But um, yeah, and, and, and we came back and, and, you know, after extra time, 1 7 1, you know. As we got each goal, as we get, 
what got to each stage as we got it to extra time as we got the winner etc the the atmosphere in the stadium just built up and it was it was electric it was mm. terrific yeah so yeah um yeah Watford 7 Southampton 1 yeah I love that Tommy special memories at Vicarage Road is it one or two that stick out for you as well uh I my first goal was at Vicarage Road against South End who I was on loan from um and then obviously you know the playoff games great atmosphere um and the first Premier League game here against Wimbledon uh, was a fabulous atmosphere. Didn't get the result, but we had to wait for that a little bit longer. But that was a great atmosphere. Mm, incredibly special always here at Vicarage Road. Don't forget to keep those questions coming in. Another chance for you a little bit later on in the show to get yours in. Of course, we're live, of course, right the way through until 8 o'clock tonight. Comments box in the section below on YouTube and, of course, on Twitter as well. At Watford FC, use the hashtag of Inside the Hive. Um, Kenny, let's move on to your coaching career now uh, here at Watford and of course your time as manager as well um, we've mentioned a little bit about working with Tommy but what was he actually like yeah the, the the side that Tommy played in here was it was the hardest working side I've ever seen and and you know Graham Taylor was was the manager and as solid a group of lads as again you know you could see you're looking at Alec Chamberlain which was a fantastic signing wasn't he yeah you know what a, what a goalkeeper but you know Chamberlain Gibbs Millen Page, Robinson, Mooney, you know, uh, Richard Johnson came through the youth team uh, uh, there, signed, you know, Micah Hyde, Peter Kennedy, you know, uh, uh, right and smart, you know, so he put that t side together in a, in a summer, really, and it, and it was brilliant. But in terms of then Tom fitting into that, he really did epitomise the, you know, the work rate that, that got us two promotions in in two years and I'm not being you know disrespectful to any of those lads but there wasn't a John Barnes in that team or you know a necessarily a, a, you know a Premier League level let's say a special player but the, the the group and what the what the team achieved was sort of much greater than any individual and, and Tommy through going to from left centre half left wing centre forward Graham Taylor was brilliant at being able to just change the system and it and it take the side on again and and Tom was sort of quite central to that wherever he played. So it's a it's a you know it's a big compliment to to, to be a key you know a key part of any promotion team. And Tommy, having someone like Kenny involved with the coaching and management of a side who's so well respected by the fans and has played so much for players coming into that environment, there's always a lot of respect for a, for a coach like that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's you know that because of. Ken's history with the football club, you understand that. But players coming into the club, they just meet the, the person, the character. Um, and, you know, it, there was no messing around when Ken was taking a session where everybody knew that. So that followed on from the way that the gaffer coached. You know, as soon as you start a session, as soon as you get on the training pitch, when you come out of the doors of the training ground, it's a serious session. And it's, it's not just technical and tactical, it's about how you approach the game and, and how you were as, as, as teammates because, you know, together stronger as a team. And it, like Kenny said, that, you know, I've said many times, that's the best dressing room I've ever been involved in. All the way up from, you know, the kit man to the gaffer mm. with the players in the middle somewhere. Um, it was just a brilliant dressing room full of really strong characters. Was coaching and management something you always kind of had a thought? I know your career with with your injuries, I'm sure you wanted to play a lot longer, but was coaching and management always on your mind? Yeah, it was actually. I, I had my full qualifications by the time I was 24. You know, everything you could get at that time, I did. Now, I, you know, I was playing then and I didn't realise that, you know, by the time I was, I was 28, I'd be retired. But even so, it, it was always something that I wanted to do and, and was interested in. And just saw as you know a, a natural opportunity when, you know, when I finished playing to be able to do that. And, and I'm very thankful for Watford for for giving me that opportunity because it is it is quite young to to be starting. You know, when I was around about 27, 28, I think I had a, a year left on a playing contract, and and you know the club sort of allowed me to go and assist the youth team manager, and then you know very then very quickly be able to do that in my own right. And and it and it gave me a you know a good grounding because then by the time so sort of Graham Taylor come back into the club. I'd done sort of six years of, of different of different roles at the club, working with different people, and it's something you know. When I watch 
players now go in straight into management is something that I think you can maybe do a little bit too quickly and, and, and having a ground in and it, it's just worked out for me that way if you're looking at say maybe a Brendan Rodgers or whatever you know they were coaching at 21 they were coaching young and they, they, they basically you've uh, you know there's, there's no shortcut you've, you've got to put the hard yards in in terms of coaching you've got to do the sessions you've got to do the seasons you know you've got to do a few clubs to actually learn the trade. Do you think Ken it, it, it helped you when you actually became first team coach and first team manager that a lot of the players you'd coached already in the youth team it, it did help definitely and and but it's probably half the squad wasn't it yeah it was no no there was a lot and there was a lot of good players come through you know at the, at the, at the time as well very good players you know when talking about that that side that you played in with Richard Johnson coming through Paul Robinson coming through you know it's quickly followed by some you know Gifton and Tommy Smith you know, there's some really good players in that group that um, I, I had known as, uh, as younger players. And, and, you know, in terms of the experience, though, the, the, the time that it really benefited me, Tom, really was, was then when I left and then went elsewhere. Because obviously then, you, you know, you, you can take that experience on. Mm. Looking at your management career, promotions, EFL trophies, you know, you've had a, a tremendously successful career so far already. Um, do you ever think back to things that obviously... Graham Taylor used to do, and did that ins has that inspired you on your journey so far? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, w what it sort of teaches you when you do a few years there is you have to be yourself. You know, I don't. Th I think players will see through you if you're not. And and for some players, you know, you, you won't be for them, and and that's fine. You know, but you ha you have to be yourself, and you have to work it out in terms of your own personality, what your strengths are. No nobody could replicate what Graham Taylor did. You know, nobody, there wasn't anybody like him that could come into a room full of people and, and you know, motivate them so well. But, yeah, were there things that uh, I picked up from him and, and still use now? Definitely, because, you know, they're the, the basics of the game and, you know, those basics don't change. When I listened to, I was listening to Troy Deeney and, and speak and, you know, speaks very, very well on Match of the Day there and... and He's, he's talking about the basics of the game and that those things haven't changed. Mm, no, massively. And, and just finally on the kind of coaching side of things, obviously something you're looking to get stuck back into as soon as possible at the minute? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I've travelled around a lot, I've got to be honest with you, in terms of the country and you know, I do want to stay in this area now, if possible. If that means another role, you know, I'm, I'm open-minded to it and I'm happy to sort of discuss whatever comes along. Uh, uh, but um, you know, I don't think I, I want to be sort of moving around the country too much now so you know we'll see what comes up but I'm open-minded to different roles uh, and you know football in the end has, has been my life and it's you know it's fantastic I, I certainly don't take it for granted though you know you have to earn every every single thing that you get out of football you have to earn yeah I'm sure everyone watching yeah wishes you all the best for that next chapter as well and we look forward to seeing what that may be Thank you. Uh, of course on the show then we've asked questions of, of Tommy so far uh, in our little quiz there's another little quiz we have on the show of course which is our 60 second challenge Tommy's currently joint fifth on that leaderboard with a whole host of current Watford stars. Will he be knocked further down the leaderboard today? Well, let's find out, because up next, it's Peter Atibo. I'm Peter Atibo. This is my 60 second challenge. Long distance running or short distance? Shots. iPhone or Android? iPhone. City life or country? City. First car? Audi. Most famous person on your phone? My wife. If you could play a musical instrument, what would it be? Whiskey. Worst thing about pre-season? Need to run out. Morning person or night owl? Morning. Text message or phone call? Phone call. Match day superstition? Superstition. VAR, love it or hate it? Eight. Keeper gets injured, are you going in goal? Yes. Childhood hero? Shut. <laughs> oh my goodness. Come again? Childhood hero. So favourite player? As a child? Uh, Peter Crush. Coach or pundit when you retire? Coach pundit. or TV? Studs or blades? Studs. If you could change position, where would you play? Striker. Favourite musician or group? Who's kid? Penalty shootout, would you go first or last? First.
16 points, Tommy, your place is secure still in joint fifth place. Uh, right, let's talk you through some exciting things coming your way here at Watford then. Of course, to celebrate International Women's Day, there's a free ticket offer for all season ticket holders and Arsenal match buyers if you want to go and see the women's team in action. Sunday, the 20th of March, 2 o'clock kickoff here at Vicarage Road. You can claim your ticket at tickets.watfordfc.com. Uh, if you're one of our younger fans watching tonight, don't forget to get involved with the Junior Hornets. We've got some great membership opportunities available for you, some great giveaways, chance for you to be a mascot as well. Just go to juniorhornets.watfordfc.com. And if you fancy grabbing yourself a bargain from the club shop, 40% off all kale me at the moment. Go to shop.watfordfc.com. Now, coming up this summer, there's an incredibly special event which many of you may wish to get involved in, which is taking place uh, in honour of the late, great Glenn Roder. It's a race day. We can take a look at the details here. Uh, it's going to be at uh, Newmarket Racecourse on the 23rd of July. A charity race day in memory of ex Watford player and manager Glenn Roder and aimed in aid of the Brain Tumour Charity. You can find out more information at the Glenn Roder race day.com is the website and of course uh, Tommy and Kenny a man both of you will know well. Um, Tommy your memories of Glenn? Well obviously he signed me here at, at Watford so without Glenn there would be no Watford um, history for me. Um, I'd never scored any goals here at Vicarage Road. So, you know, eternally grateful, grateful for that. And, and but Glenn was a, uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a great bloke. Um, I played against him when he was player manager at Gillingham and he spent 90 minutes kicking me for the whole entire time. And the fact that I kept going and keep, kept giving him a little mouthful back was, the, was what spurred him to, to sign me. But I only found that out after I'd signed for Watford. <laughs> Um, so yeah, really grateful to to Glenn and you know I've um, message with with Holly his daughter about the the race day. I think it's a fabulous um, charity day and for a, for a great great cause. And uh, Kenny, another man taken way too soon from us. Yeah, it's a, such a you know such a tragedy really. But for, for Glenn anyway, he was he was club captain for for a spell. And, and, and then manager, and, and manager in, you know, it was quite testing times to be manager at the time, but he, he always conducted himself with, with such, you know, fantastic dignity. He had respect from everybody, you know, at the club, everybody that, that he met. And then as I got to know him well, a real sort of keen sense of humour as well, the more, the more I did get to know him. So, you know, looking forward to the, to, to the race day, definitely. And as you say, for, for a good cause, for, for a fantastic man. There's going to be lots of fundraising taking place as well, of course, to raise lots of funds for the charity. And Tommy, you've got something incredibly special uh, that you're going to be donating to that. I do. I have my, my very first Watford shirt um, from the first season when, when I signed for the they club with number 11 on because Paul Furlong was the number nine, so I couldn't get it off, off big fours. So I was just happy to be in the team and scoring goals. So it's my very first shirt um, and hopefully... Some Watford fans will, will raise some money for, like we say, a, a, a fabulous cause. Yeah, amazing. I'm sure you're going to sign that and get, we'll get it all framed up and stuff, I'm sure, as well. So a great bit of memorabilia. So if you are a Tommy fan, a Watford fan, and you want to get your hands on that, just keep an eye on all the charity activities that are going to be happening around that race day. And that very special item could be yours. And, of course, raising money in memory of a very, very special person. OK, time now to move on to the next section of the show, and it is the return of the Watford Greatest Eleven. We've been putting this together <coughs> over the season so far. We've picked our goalkeeper, we've got our defenders in place, and we're going to be picking a right side of midfield player today. Of course, Ben Foster's our goalkeeper. We've got Gibbs, Mariapa, McClelland and Robinson, Tommy's best mate, uh, along the back four. Uh, so that's the team we have at the moment. Uh, Kenny, it's going to be your honour to pick our right side of midfield player. And of course, first of all, what do you look for? in a right side of midfield player if you're a manager right now and you were trying to sign someone? In that format, definitely what he does going forward is number one, uh, definitely. And then number two, what else he can do for the team. You know, whether that be defensive, uh, picking up second balls, uh, tracking runners, but, but, but definitely that number one category of, of goals and assists and what, what he can bring is, is a big part of that position. And Tommy, a right-sided player, I guess right or left-sided player, are important in getting that ball forward to get supply to you, especially with crosses? Yeah, I think if you if you're playing in a in a two up front um, and you've got wide players in the team, it's knowing when the ball's coming into the box, so you can make your runs and hopefully get in front of the the, the defenders. 
Um, so I think that that's the key to it as well, is having a relationship with the wide players. Certainly during my time, it was perhaps more from the full-backs <coughs> that I got crosses in the box here, like Darren, Darren Baisley um, and Neil Cox from, from that side of the pitch. But definitely uh, agree with Ken. I think it, it, wide players are, are, are classed as forward players and you know now it's all about assists and goals. Yeah, it certainly is. Right, let's run through your short list. Let's start off with it. Jared Delafeu, uh, a great player. Yeah, I thought he was a real talent and you know something that, that um, he, he could play either side and, and could play sometimes as a 10 and, and watching different Watford managers use him maybe at times then use him off the bench but he's a, he's a game changer and somebody that I enjoyed watching play and, and thought he had a, a real talent to affect the game. Mm, Tommy had great impact didn't he on the side in recent years? It was a fabulous signer. I'd seen him play a lot in, in Milan when I was watching um, some of the lone players play in Italy um, and when he when he signed for the club, I thought it was a fabulous sign, and he went on to to prove that. And you know, the FA Cup final against uh, semi final against uh, Wolves, you know, he brought the team back into the game on his own. Certainly did. Uh, next contender is Mela Sarr. Yeah, I, I love his pace and power as a as a defender. I was, was a former defender myself. You know that w when you're playing against pace, you're you're always worried, and and you know he he takes this goal very very well and, and and on his day i think you know for for any side in the country he can give them problems so yeah another another player i really like mm, absolutely yeah just that, that pace and assists last season he got more goals um than he might have expected to get him himself i think that's that's probably the issue with the smiler he doesn't know how good he actually could be Hmm. Uh, notable mention, of course, uh, Ashley Young. Of course, he play, can play on both sides, but it's worth giving him a notable mention at this point. Yeah, you have to mention him anyway. I mean, m mainly a left-sided player, but but as you say, played a variety of roles for, for Watford. But if if you can get a, a a player who's intelligent, who's left-footed to play on the right, then it gives you gives you more options. And I always thought with, with him, it was it was an option. But yeah, Ashley Young's a, an outstanding player. Okay. The pressure now falls on to you to pick your winner. We've obviously had a couple of notable mentions there, but uh, who is the player that you would like to select to add to our greatest 11? Yeah, I've selected Nigel Callaghan, a player that played w with myself. Um, he was slightly overshadowed at the, uh, in a very good team, as I said, I've said earlier, slightly overshadowed by by, by Barnes and Blissett, but for, for people that would be watching Watford at that time, they would realise that he was as good and just as important to us. Um, his delivery was fantastic. He could get, you know, Tommy would have loved playing with, with, with Nigel Callaghan at his, at his peak because you knew that ball was coming in the box and it was coming in with pace. He had a fantastic set, set piece delivery and got some key goals. And, and the three or four years he, you know, he had at Watford where he was really at his peak, he, he was an excellent wide right player. And um, in terms of goals and assists, his early crossing was, was as good as anybody in the country. Yeah, another, another great selection to add to that team. Another notable name that gets added to the Watford greatest 11 there, Nigel Callaghan. And selected by Kenny Jackett, your name goes alongside it as well, Kenny. So we know who, uh, who picked who. And we... Obviously, we can see Tommy picked his best mate, of course, as left back, which we're never going to let him forget on this show. Uh, throughout the rest of the season, then, of course, we will add more names to that Watford Greatest Eleven. Will one of your favourites feature? Uh, make sure you keep joining us here on the show to find out. And of course, if you're watching this live on YouTube right now, make sure you hit the subscribe button as well. That means you'll get to see all the great content coming up in the next few weeks and months. OK, let's turn our attention now to this weekend. Chance to get on the road and potentially pick some points up uh, as we try travel down to St Mary's to take on Southampton. Uh, Tommy, um, Southampton have lost their last two, potentially that could make them dangerous because they want to get a win. They've been quite good at home recently, but the chance for Watford to get something out of this one. Yeah, it's a good opportunity. Like I say, we've got to wait until Sunday. Everybody else will play around. So for, for a day or so, um, we'll be level on the amount of games that we've played. It's just a massive game on the back of a, a disappointing defeat at, at at Wolves yesterday so it, massive that we go there and get something out of the game but we've put ourselves in a position where points are not enough we've got to go go for the win and like you say they're not in the best of form uh, uh, of late but it's about how we react from that defeat you know how the dressing room reacts to the the performance at, at Wolves and the mistakes that were made um, and if it comes out strong 
then we've got a chance at St Mary's. Of course, Kenny, you spent some time on, on the South Coast managing Portsmouth, Southampton's rivals. Um, a word on Ralph Hasenhutl as a manager, because of course they, they've stuck by him after a couple of big defeats in the last couple of the seasons. Yeah, he's been, he looks excellent, really. And, and you know, there's a succession of, of successful people at Southampton, you know. So it's a very, very good club and stable club to manage. And, 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 and Ralph's, you know, taken it on very well. For, for, for Watford, anyway, there's no easy games in, in the Premier League. There's not going to be. But it's interesting to listen to to Roy Hodgson where he's saying some of their, their better performances they haven't been able to get the wins out of and, and hopefully you know there's one of those those um, those big performances, there's good performances coming at the weekend and, and then you know some, some luck follows that brings the result and, and then in terms of the players the result in confidence. Yeah, Messi, what, what do you think Watford needs to do this weekend Tommy? They need the type of performance that they had in the previous uh, away games at, at Villa Park and at Old Trafford where for spells they were very, very structured in their strategic defending, but then in the counter-attack um, they went and tried to, to, to score goals, certainly getting three points at Villa Park and then a good point at Old Trafford. They need that away per, a performance, not the one from Molyneux. Mm. Kenny, sometimes when, you're, when you are struggling, I know sometimes playing at home, is, you know, you've got your fans with you and they're incredibly supported here at Vicarage Road, but sometimes when you're in a bit of a tricky situation, is it sometimes easier to go on the road and pick up points? I, th I think the big thing, home or away at the moment, for, 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 for Watford is the first goal. You know, you're looking at the, 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 the Wolves game and, you know, Wolves got the early goal. They maybe needed to, you know, keep it tight for 20 minutes, half an hour. Uh, in the end, you know, Watford are going to need to get that first goal themselves. And, and, you know, against Wolves, it's, it's a tough side to play if they score first. And, and, and I think Southampton's similar uh, um, because, you know, the stadium lifts, the players gain confidence. So, yeah, home or away, uh, a first goal is really, really a big key thing for the confidence. Yeah, it certainly is. And if you're travelling down to St Mary's at the weekend, make sure you bring your support for the lads. We're certainly going to need it this weekend. And of course, if you can't make it to the game, keep your eyes on social media. Tommy will be on commentary, as always, on that one. And you can keep up to date with everything on the social media channels. Um, Kenny, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. And I know Tommy. you've been looking forward to this part. Yeah. It's your questions. Uh, Tommy set the bar uh, massively high with just one point. Um, so fingers crossed you're going to do a lot better than that. And I did see how ruthless you were with him as well, to be honest with you. Don't you? I'm going to be a lot nicer to you, Kenny, because we'd love you to come back again a at some stage. A bit more stage, lenient, so. maybe. Yeah, yeah. massively. Uh, so your first question, uh, you and Tommy have something in common when it comes to your debuts, and that's who you played against. So question number one, who was your Watford debut against? Sunderland. Correct. One point on the board. Thank you. Question number two. In the 1984 FA Cup semi-final, you played Plymouth. Of course, it was a 1-0 victory, but where was the game? Villa Park. Correct. Two points. I mean, everybody knows that, that even FA Cup semi-finals were played at Villa Park. Or there was always a couple. It wasn't just Villa Park. There was two games. There was a Every game. season there was one at Villa Park. There was game, one at Villa it? Park. but It was a long time ago, though, Tom. It was only... uh, question number three. This one's a little <laughs> bit harder, but I think you're going to get it. Uh, you obviously won the EFL Trophy in 2019 with Portsmouth. 2-2 two -two at full time. It went to penalties. Your Portsmouth side scored all their penalties. But Sunderland missed one in the shootout to give you your victory. Which Sunderland player missed their penalty? Ledbetter. Lee Catamol. Lee Catamol. I've got it wrong. That's right. You're Is still that one winning. off? You're no. still winning. You've still, still got two <laughs> points. Uh, question number four. On the 22nd of September 1982, you made your Welsh international debut in a 1-0 win over a particular side in a Euro <laughs> 84 qualifier. Who was the team? Norway. Correct. Three points. <laughs> Uh, right, question five is a joint question for both of you. Uh, what we'll do is Tommy will give me an answer and you get to go higher or lower. Got you. uh, you've already won, so it's just a bit of fun. But here's the question. Tommy, by the fastest route, we're going to go on a journey. We're going to start at Watford. We're going to take a stop off at Millwall. We're then going to go to Portsmouth before finishing our journey at Rotherham. To do that journey, how many miles... Well, we have travelled. 284. 284. Kenny, are you going to go higher or lower? So we're going... Millwall, Portsmouth. We're, we're going higher. You're going higher than that. Uh, from here to Millwall is 25 miles. From Millwall to Portsmouth is 76. And then it's a 221-mile trip to get you to Rotherham. So it's 322 miles, which means, Kenny, you've got yourself another point And you are the unanimous winner... I've asked Tommy this week. Congratulations, Tom. 
I went the back roads, it's a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy always argues his route on there where he likes to go. Uh, thank you so much for joining for our bit of fun. It's been though. a pleasure. It's Thanks. good. Uh, before we let you go, we've got some final fan questions. Uh, so as always, a massive thank you to every single one of you uh, for getting involved and sending some questions in. Uh, Joe May says, uh, if you could take one of the modern era Watford players to play in your 80s team, who would it be? Yeah, that is a, that is a good question. Yeah, Saar really, where you, you, you're looking for pace either wing, and, and you know Saar would be the player at the moment uh, that could that could you know help in that team, uh, particularly with the, uh, at that sort of time anyway. The, the flexibility that we had with the forwards to be able to uh, play them in dip, different positions and then still get goals. Yeah, massively. Uh, next question comes from Mark Owens. Uh, what's it like being a pundit? And they've added an extra line of remind you of the FA Cup semi-final Watford versus Wolves at Wembley. Yeah, that, that was um, yeah, it was r really good, uh, and um, you know, enjoyed the game. And it, you know, like like Tommy says, you know, Delafu coming on uh, changed it. So yeah, I did enjoy it definitely. And but but I am an observer and you know a student of the game really. And we all started as as supporters somewhere along the line as kids, you know. And you should never forget that either. Yeah, um, Tommy, I'm going to ask you what it's like being a pundit. Obviously, you do the commentaries on. On uh, obviously on a, on, a, on, a, on a weekend and obviously you get to spend time with me on this show. Yeah, I have a really good partner in John Marks when I do the commentary. <laughs> and then there's this show. <laughs> <laughs> but you enjoy it though? I, yeah, because I get to see some, some old friends. Yeah, no, massively. No, it's good. Nothing it's to do with you, Michael. Just no, no, I wasn't there. expecting it. After I destroy you every week with that game, I wasn't expecting any kind of uh, any comment. But I guess for you watching the games in the stadium, and, and it must be quite nice to be week in, week out in a, in a, in a stadium watching the games. We all missed watching live football during lockdown so to get a promotion during that season when there's no fans in the stadium was a terrific achievement but we're all back in the stadiums this year, this season so certainly from a commentary point of view it's, it's a lot better when I'm watching the game live as compared to off a TV screen but nevertheless the atmosphere in the stadiums is, is why we all love it. No, it certainly is. Final question comes from Richard Clark. Uh, which current player would you say your game is most compar comparable to? Uh, for myself, hmm. yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Um, Connor, Co I know I was left-footed, but Connor Cody, really, in terms of you know playing as a defender and not necessarily the you know the the the, the biggest one either. Yeah. Hmm. What about you, Tommy? What myself? Yeah. So if you, um, Sorry, Thierry, on, Thierry on. I was going to say Thierry picks up like Harry Kane out of the bag or something, isn't it? Yeah. No, but is, that, is that like a player you I watch now? And poor you, man's you Alan Shearer, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, I love that. And just finally, I guess it's a question we, me and Tommy speak out a lot of time is, is the fans here at Watford. They are incredibly special. You know, every former player seems to get a great welcome when they come back. And someone like yourself, who's, who's got such a, a connection and, and such a heritage with, with the side. Um, how special are the fans here? Yeah, very. And, and, you know, being a local lad, a lot of my family, you know, friends still, still live in the area. And Watford's our club and it always will be. So, you know, it's always, it's, it's, it's always there. And, and you know, for many of the ex-players on that list, what, you, you see them around, you see them locally, you see them in the, you know in the football world, and, and it's a it's a fantastic link, you know, in terms of the the, the, the supporters that uh, you know when, when you've grown up in a local area, you know so many of them as as the supporters are just talking there in the break, and and you you know all the clubs that I've been, but you know we can still we can still say that's Don Fraser, and we know him, and and you know that's a. That's a fantastic feeling. It's very special. Um, Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. It's tonight. a pleasure. No yeah, problem. It's been I've great. It. We look forward to seeing your next chapter, whatever that may be in, in management and coaching. And thank we, uh, yeah, thank you for your time tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Tommy, as always, I would say we're going to let you get back to the DIY now, but you've finally succumbed and letting the professionals come in tomorrow. No, yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I, can, I can sleep well tonight knowing that they're going to come and cover my mess up. <laughs> Amazing. Have a great weekend. Enjoy St Mary's on Sunday as well. And a massive thank you, as ever, goes to you for watching. Really do appreciate it when you send your questions in. Uh, don't forget, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. We'll be back next Thursday with another show as we take you inside the hive.